Well, I'm glad that you've joined us. My name is Armin. And if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Zechariah chapter 4. And uh, if this is your first time with us uh, on whatever platform you're using to, to watch and participate in the worship service, I invite you to follow us on Facebook, to subscribe uh, if you're on YouTube, and whichever platform you're using to share this so that other people will be able to enjoy the worship service as well. And download the Grace Church on the Mount app, because there you find sermon notes, you find the Bible that we're using, and all kinds of useful stuff, including uh, the announcements that we shared with you today. So, what is it that causes discouragement? Uh, we, we live in an, era, in an era where there are a lot of people who are discouraged, and it generally arises during times of prolonged absences or illnesses, social isolation, like now. And it's amazing how discouragement drags at our feet. It can cloud the, the brightest day with gloom. So, so how is it that we defeat discouragement? Well, it, part of the secret is to understand the, the sovereign planning and control and the purposes of God and to anchor ourselves in those. Uh, if you have a Bible and you've turned with me to Zechariah chapter 4, let me give you a little bit of the context. Uh, the, the people of God, the Jewish people, have returned from exile in the year 538 B.C., uh, they had been exiled to Babylon, then Babylon had been conquered by Persia, and then the, a Persian king by the name of Cyrus the Great, uh, really by the, the movement of God in his heart, gives the Jews permission to go back to the land of Israel, back to Jerusalem, and even to rebuild the temple, which was the centerpiece of Jewish life. But now, 18 years have passed. It's now 520 B.C. The people are discouraged. And Zechariah 4, we see the prophet Zechariah, who's a young man, by the way, probably in his very early 20s. And he's been having visions that God has given to him, night visions, really like waking dreams that the Lord has given to him that are prophetic in nature, God is revealing his program for the future, both the immediate future and the far distant future. So I'm going to read for you from Zechariah chapter 4, starting with verse 1 all the way through verse 14. And as I read, bear in mind that whenever you see the word Lord in all uppercase letters, and we've talked about this in the past, it refers to God's personal name, Yahweh. If you see the, the word Lord in small letters, uh, lowercase letters, it refers to something else. So keep that in mind as I read. Zechariah 4, starting with verse 1. Then the angel who talked to me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And when he uses the word my Lord there, it's, it's like saying sir. So it's like, what are these, sir? And he answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Who's Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel is the governor of the Jewish community in Jerusalem and its environs now in uh, starting in 538 all the way now it's 520. And he says, this is the word of the Lord for him. What are you, mighty mountain? Oh, actually, he starts before that. He says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. 
what are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it! God bless it! Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things, since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. When you, when you see references to the seven eyes of the Lord, that's referring to the, the all-knowing nature of God. Uh, seven is a perfect number, so it's referring to his perfect knowledge of everything that takes place in eternity. So he says, who dares despise the day of small things since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. When I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the, on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. So Zechariah 4 gives us the secret, the, the antidote to overcoming discouragement. And here it is in a nutshell. This is a big idea for you to carry away with you today. That when, when God gives you something to do, you pursue God's work in God's way, and God will provide. In fact, when we follow and seek to do the work of the Lord, he's going to make specific provisions, several specific provisions. He's going to provide his spirit, his timing, and also his leaders. And I want to unpack each of those in turn. So let's start with the first provision, his spirit. The, the vision of Zechariah 4 focuses on the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple in 520 B.C. And the book is full of double fulfillment prophecy. And we've talked about this in the past. And a double fulfillment in the sense that there's a near fulfillment, one that would be in Zechariah's day, and then also a, a distant future fulfillment. And the, the distant fulfillment really has to do with the rebuilding of the temple and the reign of Jesus when he comes during what we call his millennial kingdom after his return to earth, which we haven't seen yet. But the focus of our message today is the near fulfillment. The, that's the primary focus, the rebuilding of the temple in the late 6th century B.C. In the first temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians when they sacked Jerusalem 70 years earlier and had taken the Jews off into exile. Uh, that was actually a judgment of God. One of the visions, uh, central features that Zechariah experiences in the passage we just read is a lampstand that stands in the, the holy place of the temple. Uh, God had commanded that it be there. In fact, you can find a description of it in Exodus chapter 25. A uh, uh, number of years ago, uh, I, I traveled with one of our elders to Israel, and I was on an El Al flight, uh, which is the national airline of Israel, and there, was a, there were a lot of Orthodox Jewish people on that flight, and I was reading a book about the Western Wall where the Temple of Solomon had been, and there was an Orthodox fellow sitting next to me, and very rarely do they engage in conversation with Gentiles like me, but he looked at what I was reading and he, and he said, you know, we are expecting the temple to be rebuilt in our lifetime. And I said, I know. And I talked to him about when I had been at the Western Wall in the, the square by the temple there, and I had seen in a plexiglass case the, the lampstand 
that the temple society of Jerusalem had built and prepared in anticipation of the new temple that will be built in Jerusalem. I mean, they're actually, uh, they are uh, Jewish people and artisans who are making implements that, will, that they intend to stand and to, and to be used in the new temple. I mean, can you imagine that? And uh, I took a photo of of that behind the plexiglass. If you ever go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, and you can see the same, the very same model. Well, Zechariah sees a lampstand. He also sees two olive trees alongside the lamp, and the lamps are fueled by an inexhaustible supply of oil. And the oil that fuels the lamp symbolizes God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the, the prophet asks the angel, he goes, so what's this all about? But the angel doesn't give him a straight answer. Instead, he gives Zechariah a message for Zerubbabel, who is the governor of Jerusalem, and also, you might say, the, the project chairman uh, of building the temple. He's a key player. And he, and he says this in Zechariah 4.6, this is the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And the point of the message is that if you want to accomplish anything for God that's worthwhile and lasting, you better not rely upon your own abilities and brilliance. Now, Zerubbabel must have been a pretty smart guy. Uh, he was no doubt skilled. Uh, and there are a lot of skilled people in the world today. And, and one of the prevailing attitudes that we often have is, you know, we can do this. We got this. Just do it. I can do this. But that's arrogance, isn't it? And this is part of the lesson for Zerubbabel and the people in Jerusalem back then. It's been 18 years since the work has begun, and it's stalled. It's fallen flat, and there's frustration. And you can see it uh, in, the, uh, in other leaders like the prophet Haggai, who is a contemporary of Zechariah, who confronts the people in their apathy in Haggai uh, chapter 1, verse 2, where he basically says, you're saying it's not yet time to build the temple? I mean, what's that about? Realize this. God's work screeches to a halt. Often, it, it's often that it screeches to a halt when we attempt to do God's work by human means. It may be the right work, but we're doing it in the wrong way. And when that happens, it kind of starts with a hiccup and then it stops with a, a yawn. I mean, think about this. When we rely on business principles, we get what business can do. And sometimes that's a good thing. When we rely on common sense, we get what common sense can do. And that can be a good thing. When we rely on human ingenuity, we get sometimes amazing things that human ingenuity can accomplish. And each of these qualities is valuable. But when we rely on the Holy Spirit, we get what only God can do. In 538... B.C., the work had started. Now it's 520, and it's a dud. They had laid the foundation, and the work had stopped. When we start something but can't finish it, it may not be that we're doing the wrong thing. It may not be the wrong vision. It's that we're fueling it the wrong way. We're not relying upon the resource of God's Spirit. And human effort, without the Holy Spirit energizing it, will burn out like a light bulb with a bad filament. Human resolve and, and grit alone will not accomplish the work of God. We can do a whole lot on a human level, but human effort alone will not light the world. So if you're going to do a a great work for God that, that God has given you to do and, and told you to do. You pursue that work. You pursue God's work in God's way, and God will provide. He provides his spirit, first of all. You rely on that, first and foremost. Second, he, 
his second provision is his timing. Uh, what are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground, Zechariah 4.7. Uh, what is this mighty mountain? Well, he's talking about obstacles. He's talking about difficulties. He's talking about opposition that discouraged the people. I mean, you realize that, that when the people of Israel came back to Jerusalem, back into the land, the people that had uh, been occupying the land uh, weren't happy about their new neighbors coming in and displacing them and, and doing the work that God had given them to do. But when God gives a vision, don't give up. His spirit will work at the right time to demolish mountainous obstacles. And then notice what he says in Zechariah 4, 7. He says, then he will bring out the capstone. That's the, the, finishing, uh, the finishing touch of the work to shouts of, God bless it! God bless it! And the capstone was the topping out of the project, and it results in shouts of praise. That's what's predicted here. A good reminder here, when God does something through his people, it's a good thing to celebrate it. Uh, you know, there are many folks in our, in our church. One of the things that Tim said during announcements is that it, church hasn't closed. We're not, not able to meet in the building right now, but, but ministry is going on uh, in the midst of this pandemic. And um, you've continued to, to stock the food pantry that's feeding people. Uh, there are prayer teams and intercessors who are actively doing battle for the church and for our world. Uh, there are many of you who are participating in small groups and leading small groups. I mean, who would have even thought a year or two ago uh, that we would be using Zoom? I, to be honest with you, a year or two ago, I didn't even know what Zoom was. I had no idea that there was an app called that. I know, I'm a dinosaur. What can I say? Uh, children's ministry workers are doing Sunday school online. The body of Christ is functioning at grace. It's, it's functioning as a body, not merely as individuals. And when God works through his people, we should celebrate it, give glory to God. The work has not stopped. And so the Lord brings about his results according to his timing, his timeline. He will accomplish his work. In Zechariah 4.9, we read, The hands of Zerubbabel, that's the governor, remember, have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. So Zechariah is told that the work isn't going to drag on for centuries. It's not going to language. It's, it's going to require perseverance, but it's not just going to go on and on and on. There's going to be an end point. You're going to see the fruit of your labors. And that's one of the things to remember, that when God gives you a vision and you fuel it by his spirit, then at the right time, there will be results. It may not be in your timing, but God is the one who is controlling history, and he's working the things out according to his calendar, his schedule. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in well-doing, because at the proper time, you will reap a harvest. A few years ago, I spoke with a friend of mine who had traveled to Barcelona. There is a, there's a beautiful but unfinished basilica that he and his wife visited in Barcelona, Spain, called La Sagrada Familia. Uh, it's this huge cathedral, and it's a monument to perseverance. It was designed by the Spanish architect Antony Gaudi. It was begun in 1882. But you know, at the time of Gaudi's death in 1926, less than a quarter of it had been completed. As late as 2010, the, the project was gauged to be only at its halfway mark. I mean, it's this impressive building, but it was unfinished. And the, the work just was dragging on, and it's been dragging on. In fact, now the earliest projected date for completion is sometime in, in late, the late 2020s, the decade in which we're in now. But you know, the temple construction in the 6th century B.C. Jerusalem would not be like that. It wasn't, going to be un, uh, it wasn't going to be impressive but unfinished, dragging on and on and on. 
The work was going to be completed in a timely way during the lifetime of Zerubbabel. And sometimes, great work of God has small beginnings. Zechariah 4.10 says, Who dares despise the day of small things, since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel? Don't despise small beginnings, and don't conduct a final evaluation based on size alone. To some, the, the temple seemed puny, but don't diminish and disparage the work of the Lord now, because it may very well lead to great things later on. And our common sense expectations of current progress may at times block our larger vision. God is in charge of his timetable. Nothing is hidden from his view. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. You pursue God's work in God's way, and God will provide. He provides his spirit. He provides his timing. And then third, he provides his leaders. Zechariah 4, 11 through 14 says, Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again I asked him, What are these two olive branches? Really, that's a kind of a synonym of the olive trees. What are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? And he replied, Do you not know what these are? No, my lord. So I said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Those two olive trees represent two men who have been anointed and called by God to do a work. One is Joshua, the high priest. The other is Zerubbabel, the governor. And both possess the anointing and the power that they need symbolized by the two pipes that pour out an inexhaustible supply of golden oil, which is the power source of the Holy Spirit. And Zerubbabel and Joshua together would form a a perfect partnership of both civil and priestly leadership. Each would serve in in a distinct role. And God often forms partnerships or teams of gifted people to accomplish his work. The key is that you you seek, you find, and you vest with authority God's men and women who are gifted for the vision, ones who will rely on, on God's anointing, God's power, God's fuel to accomplish the work, people who are gifted and called, empowered by the Holy Spirit. You, you let them lead, and when you do that, you will see God's work accomplished. You pursue God's work in God's way, and God will provide. He provides his spirit. He provides his timing. He provides his leaders. So here's what I want to do now. I'm gonna, I want to pray for you as I close that the Lord will grant you a vision of what he may want to do in your life, in your small group, in your church, in your family. Because when you rely on his spirit, on his spirit, and you rely on his timing to bring those plans together, and you rely on a good team that's, that's called by God and gifted by God, you will see results. Pray with me. Our Father and our God, we come before you in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, for our church. I pray, Lord, that as teams of people work in ministry together, that they will be so reliant on your Holy Spirit, so emboldened in prayer, uh, so committed to your timeline with patience and perseverance, that they will see the work get done, that they will trust the leaders that, that you have called and gifted for them. Father, I pray for leaders of families. I pray, Lord, that, that as mothers and fathers or single moms or single dads, as they partner together with others in their small groups, partner together with others who are, who are like-minded toward, toward your work, Lord, that we will see godly families raised up in our church that are built to last, just as we've envisioned. 
Father, as you give us a vision for the future of what you want to accomplish, even with opportunities that inevitably will arise as a result of this pandemic that we're in now, it's not all blocking of ministry or of opportunity. You actually have the seeds of opportunity and new things that you want to do in the midst of this. Help us to align our vision with yours and then enable us as your church, as the leaders in your church, as the families in your church, to rely upon the fuel of your Holy Spirit, to seek your timing, and to entrust the work to godly and gifted leaders so that we may see the work progress. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.